welcome, welcome, welcome to Same Script, Different Cast, Contact One, which is an extension of the SSDC podcast. I typically do that with Wikipedia Plot Reader and Movie Pop-Up. And today you're with me, seeing it. And I'm going to be going over American Horror Story, and this is episode 100. So they've done 100 episodes over their nine seasons. So with this episode, we actually start off we are in 1985, so we did a little time jump. Night Stalker and Jingli are roommates or bosom buddies. It looks like we're in a hotel, and Night Stalker is jamming to Billy Idol loudly, disturbing my German homegirl who needs to wake up early for Disneyland the next day. She goes to the room of Night Stalker and Jingli, ask him to turn down the music, please. The Night Stalker grabs the lady, like tonight's her last night on Earth, and Jingli, with his heart of gold, tells him to stop, and the Night Stalker lets the lady go. Jingli is tired of Night Stalker's murders. He's hitting Night Stalker with the, it's not you, it's me speech. Jingli just ain't that into him anymore. There's levels to this whole relationship. Bear with me because I just finished watching the Dion Cole comedy special and Jingli should have been out of there with Night Stalker a long time ago in order for him to elevate to the next level. So basically Jingli's like, I'm out. And then Night Stalker is saying, you know, Satan's not gonna be feeling that too much. And then you hear all these Satan whispers like, don't go nowhere, or Satan's here for you. Something like that. And so then we get like a little bit of exposition. We see that Jingli has been Night Stalker's sidekick for the past year. We also see that Night Stalker has killed 11 people. And it appears that Jingli watched on the sidelines. The next day, or a couple days later, Jingli and Night Stalker are at a corner store their corner store days. Night Stalker's playing more of the Billy Idol. Night Stalker gets out to grab Jingli a tab and just some other knickknacks and other things that they need as a couple. Jingli changes the music and it plays, I can't stop this feeling anymore. And that just takes something over Jingli like, I can't be in this relationship anymore. He's holding me back. So what he does, he gets out the car, he gets a newspaper that actually has the Night Stalker's picture on the front, hands it to one of the bystanders that's in front of the store, doesn't say anything. This is like a silent, a silent snitch. Points to Night Stalker in the store and Jingli walks away. The lady then yells out, El Maton, El Maton, El, ma S -S -L -L Maton, which is the killer. And so then all of the other people look around, see Night Stalker come out of the store and they haul ass chasing him. He ain't no slippery ninja anymore. So I actually looked this up. So Ramirez, which is who the Night Stalker is or based off of, he that's what happened to him. It was a straight up neighborhood of folks that chased him down and beat him. Back to the TV show, Night Stalker was arrested. Jing Lee just drives by, sees the Night Stalker being attacked by the neighborhood and drives away alone. But he's not lonely, he's happy. On to the next part of his life, got rid of that relationship. Now we're gonna cut four years later to 1989. And we're on the campground. There's graffiti on the cabins that reads, Brooke wants your blood. And it looks like people can just wander onto the campgrounds. So we see this one guy who's a photographer looking for owls and trying to capture nature. And he runs into Montana. She flirts with him and talks about his fanny pack and can she unzip it? And she kills him. Straight up knife to the gut. And then in the background you see the threesome campers from the first episode who are, who are referred to as old timers. And Xavier, they come onto the scene. Xavier actually calls dibs on the next trespasser. Xavier and Montana are together in this afterlife. A little bit later, we see that Montana and Xavier are at a tent and they're rummaging through people's things. It's then that we learn that Ray is pissed off with their behavior because of their killings. And it appears that whenever they do these killings, Ray is the one that cleans up their mess and I guess somehow disposes of the bodies. We get Xavier's monologue when he talks about how he tried to save folks. I, I guess this is similar to This is the End because if you feel like the rapture is here and you're trying to get on God's good side, you're gonna just do quote unquote nice things. I mean, that's the, the selfishness I see from Xavier because he talks about how he tried to save people but because of his guilt. He even saved Margaret but was killed. So while they're rummaging through this campsite, they find the newspaper that talks about Brooks execution for the 11 murders that happened in 1984. Ray says she didn't do it. Montana brought up that Brooke killed her. Yes, but 
it was in self-defense. And I wonder if Ray knows that or if anybody else knows that Montana was trying to get the night stalker to kill Brooke. So that's something we need to put a pin in. So the female camper who was with the guy that Montana killed comes back. He's like, hey, where's my boo? None of y'all look like my boo. And Xavier kills her. And Ray's like, I'm sick of this shit. Fuck y'all. He storms off. He's pissed. So now we're gonna cut to lifestyles of the rich and famous. So we see where Margaret has been all this time and she's filthy rich. Over this time, what she's done is she's become a rich real estate mogul by renovating infamous murder locations. I think she mentioned maybe John Wayne Gacy, the Charles Manson spot, and the Winchester mystery maze of a home and also the murder house. I wanna say it's the murder house. I feel like it is, so I'm just gonna go with that. If I'm wrong, that's my bad. And she goes into everything like, why me? Why did I go through all of this? Why did I go through the Jingly murders in the 70s and then again in 1984? Why, why, why? And that reminds me of Scream 4 where it was actually Emma Roberts who was trying to pin murders on her friends because she wanted to be that victim because victims get all this glory and this attention because they survived such a horrendous event. They are a survivor. That's a big deal. That's what she's spitting. And so then we learn, I was like, what the fuck? So Margaret married Trevor. I didn't even know that man survived. And so we cut back to years ago. Apparently he was in a coma and he survived the attempted murder. Margaret went to the hospital to go visit him. So this is in 1985. And instead of calling the cops, he said he wouldn't do that because it would be his word against hers and she had all this money so she could get lawyers and straight up OJ it. He was just saying he wants some money and she was trying to guarantee her not going to jail. So she's like, no, no, no. What we're gonna do is we're gonna get married. You know you can't testify against me because of, you know, marriage. And this is privileged. We can do it like that. And his little punk ass, he was just like, yeah, okay, let's do that. Forget about Brooke going to jail for stuff that she didn't do and now she's going to die because of it. Yeah, he needs to go. He has to get got his morals and his percept. Oh yeah, yeah, I have no feelings toward this man whatsoever. Trevor got to go. We also see from this conversation with Trevor and Margaret that she gave up on God. What's that? What that means exactly, I don't know. Um, maybe she just doesn't talk about God and everything that she's done for him. I'm not entirely sure, but I guess that'll come up in later episodes. Later, we also see that Margaret is trying to buy up more murder spots, but the locals feel like it's morbid what she's doing and dishonoring the dead. Like she wanted to create some sort of an Ed Gain experience. So Trevor shows Margaret and the assistant the newspaper because the assistant just pops in at some point saying, blah, 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 I'm the assistant, listen to me, let's make money. And shows the paper that there was the murder that Montana and Xavier committed at Camp Redwood, which Margaret still owns. So the assistant is saying, are we responsible because we still own that land? People dying on our land, what's going on? And Margaret sees this as an opportunity to have a concert with Billy Idol so that they can make money. And that's exactly what she does. So she goes to Camp Redwood. She makes this huge announcement that they're having this concert there. She offers any patrons to stay in cabins where folks were murdered. So Chet watching Margaret while she promotes this on the grounds. They have easy access to her. And Chet is just like, this is the time, opportunity. I'm trying to kill this bitch right now. Montana's just like, whoa, 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 soldier. You will have your time when she returns. Take her out then. Chet's like, cool, 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 cool. So now we're gonna cut to Brooke. She is currently in prison waiting for her execution. So while she's there, early in the episode, we did see when she was walking down the hall, Night Stalker just happens to be in the prison where she is and he speaks to her. I can't tell if he's speaking to her mind or in person, but he talks to her. The devil wants you, join our club, it's the shit. Where we are right now, Brooke is in her cell. Night Stalker talks to her about how the death row injections work. And then again, it's like, hey, you know what I'm saying? My man Satan, he wants to talk to you. He feels like you'd be a good fit with our organization. 
uh, you want to try to hear what he's trying to say. He, he, he loves what you do, he thinks you're cute. So that's the whole vibe that I'm getting at this point. She is not trying to let Satan holla. Not today, Satan, not today. Now we're gonna move our way over to Alaska where we have a reformed jingly. His name is Donald where he's living with his wife and his son. She knows his killer and murderous history. Donald Jingli works at a video store and he's up for a promotion. He learns of Margaret reopening the grounds for the concert on TV. She's reopening this camp again. We saw what happened last time. Donald Jingli tells his wife, that's in the past, it's all good baby, it's me and you, it's me and you and uh, DJ, Donald Jr. We trying to make this thing happen. We try and branch off on this whole VHS rentals. This is our life. So we're gonna go back to prison real quick while Brooke is being carted away to receive her execution. Now she's in the, I guess the execution bed because what she's getting is lethal injection. We see the Night Stalker, he's on the floor, he's drawn the pentagram out. He has used maybe his teeth to get the blood out of his wrists or I don't know, elbows or wherever has the most amount of blood. I'm not a biologist. He does something with Satan, calls for him, and he gets that X-Man apocalypse puff to go through the grates of the jail. Nope, because we're in prison, through the prison, and it gets one of the correctional officers. So now the correctional officer is possessed by Satan. Could it be Satan? So the Satanist correctional officer gets nice stalker out, and that's that. Then we cut to Jingly Donald. He returns home from a hard night at Blockbuster Video Store. I'm calling it Blockbuster. That's what it is. Blockbuster Video. Wow, what a difference. He returns home from Blockbuster, and he finds that his wife was murdered by the night stalker. He knows this because Jingle's looking for his son, he's looking for DJ, and finds him in some cupboard. But it's the flyer of the reopening of Camp Redwood starring Billy Idol. So that is when Donald Jingling knows that he has to go back. He has to get revenge on the murder of his wife, Night Stalker trying to take everything that he's been trying to build pretty much. Donald Jingly, Jingly Donald, takes DJ to his sister-in-law's place, explains, I can't do this, this is not my life. Fuck this shit, please take care of your nephew. Make sure he becomes Batman. We see him put up the hood, that hood is real. Whenever anybody puts up the hood, when Eminem put up the hood, we know it's real. It's about to go down. It's about to be a freestyle battle. It's going down. We're gonna go ahead and cut back to Brooke. She was seemingly executed for the Camp Redwood murders. And her execution was viewed by Trevor and Margaret. Again, Trevor did nothing. Trevor's a little bitch. Okay, I guess cocaine is a hell of a drug. I guess it messed up his mind, whatever. Donna, old Rita, my girl, posing as an executioner, gives Brooke some sort of super Captain America serum that revives her. I don't know how long she's been dead. I don't know if we know. Maybe this is right after her death and you revive her immediately and she doesn't take any ill zombie-like after effects. Who knows? If you've seen the reanimator, then you know what happens when you let a body lay too long. So I'll leave that at that. And so that's the end of the episode. What the entire fuck? Not today, Satan. When Satan came back, yeah, it's today. So I don't know what the hell is going on. Okay, but I'm so looking forward to the next episode. 101. So thank you so much for tuning in. Same script, different cast. Contact one with me seeing it. Well, I'm out. See, see, see right there. You see it? I think it.